All right, we are going to look at the, the proverb and wi wisdom literature with it today. Um, I'm afraid last class I, I recorded the whole thing on the encomium and then I couldn't upload it and now I've deleted it and lost it. This is just infuriating to me. But um, so hopefully that won't happen today, but uh, I may fail in some way in recording it. That's just what happens, I guess. Um, so we finished off with the suffering servant as an illustration of the encomium, so a, a work of praise, and yet it's a praise of a, uh, an unpraiseworthy object, which is an illustration of a sort of, of the wisdom of God uh, to bring things that are lowly to raise them up into lower things that are that we admire. Uh, proverbs are similarly. Um, subtle and surprising at points. It's a, the whole Bible is a treasure trove of wisdom and uh, knowing scriptures makes one wise. But Proverbs, which is the primary form of wisdom literature, uh, tend to be pre presented in the form that we recognize as, as the proverb, which is an aphorism, a, a short pithy saying, made to be memorable uh, and made to be memorized for that matter. So uh, there's something about the manner in which it is written that makes us recognize it as a proverb, even if it's not in the book of Proverbs. So often passages like one, Genesis 1, and 27 where it recounts the creation of mankind is a sort of proverb uh, insofar as it, it says something very special and memorable. And I think those, those passages in scripture really jump out at you uh, and, um, and, and lead you to want to memorize them or just simply to remember them and they pass themselves into the English language in a way that sometimes you're not even aware that they've, they've derived from scripture. So many of our uh, popular phrases in English derive from scripture and people don't even acknowledge that they came from there or maybe that's because they don't know. But aphorisms are memorable statements and remember, the word of God is to be uh, not only placed on our foreheads and on, on our wrists and on the tablets of our hearts, it's on the, the, the doors of our houses and the gates. And so what that's saying is it's to be taught, and it's to be taught to each generation. In other words, it's to be remembered. And Proverbs are the easiest form of literature to remember because of their, because they're brief and also because they're pithy, they've got substance to them. So there's a lot of light. Uh, I'm trying to find an illustration for this and I can't think of one, maybe you can help me. There's a lot of light in scripture, but these are the, point where the points where the light seems to not be the brightest, the light seems to clarify in, in a way that we can see something very coherent. So I know that black things draw light, but that's, that's not quite the illustration. It's almost like a mountain. They stick out, these, these phrases. Uh, Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, which is what we're going to look at today, are the prominent forms of wisdom literature, although the book of James is one as well. And that's interesting, and it changes the way you look at the book of James, by the way. It is an epistle, but it's also written as wisdom literature, so it should not be read in the same way as other epistles are. And if you try to read it in the same way, you create yourself create all sorts of problems for yourself. You know the reason that you do not you're not well is you don't pray and so forth. And so people just say, well, it says, if you, and if you just prayed enough that you would get the answer that you wanted, that's what it says in the book of James. So they're reading it like an epistle, but that it's a it's a it's wisdom literature. There's a tendency there. It's not saying you put the quarter in and you get the gumball out. If you, th if you read it that way, then you're dreadfully disappointed, one, that it hasn't happened that way, <coughs> and, and, and two, you are, um, tend to reduce God to a sort of, you know, our, our errand boy. I prayed and you didn't do this, and you said you would do it, so it leads to a great deal of disappointment. Whereas if you recognize it as wisdom literature, the reason you don't ask is you don't pray. 
that is a saying something general and true about human nature. Praying is, is uh, one of the primary means by which God delivers his blessings upon people. But that doesn't mean that whenever you pray for something, if you're sick, that you're going to become well. And if you don't, it's because you haven't prayed hard enough, which is I've heard many times, which is pastorally appalling. And not just insensitive, it's, it's, it's uh, the poor person who's suffering an illness is now cursed with the accusation that they're not faithful enough by the people who are uh, around them trying to comfort them. We just need to pray more. Which, uh, you know, in addition to physical anxiety, uh, distress now has a spiritual distress heaped on them and, and an ostracism from the community almost. So again, the genre of literature is an important thing to recognize in that. But let me get back to the uh, wisdom literature in general. So the book of uh, Proverbs is obviously a form of wisdom literature. So is Ecclesiastes. We'll look at those two. The epistle of James is. And then there are littered examples all over the place. Large parts of the book of Job, probably. For which reason some people think that the book of Job is not a narrative. So it's not to be taken as a um, something like the story of Abraham. It's not a series of episodes. It's talking about a man and then it's talking about a dialogue and so forth. So it's a very, it's, it has hints of realism and yet it departs from the, those narrative types of realism. Some think it's uh, more like a novel in that sense. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that, that there's a recognition that the book of Job is different from other narrative portions of scripture. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Proverbs are essential to biblical teaching, though. Let me just say that. They are simulta simultaneously brief and profound. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount has a proverbial quality to it. You've heard it said, but I say to you. That, that strong, pithy, repetitive, aphoristic, those sayings, which are simu simultaneously uh, simple and yet deep, that has the quality of aphorism or, or proverb to it. So he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, it says in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10. It says a couple of really interesting, profound things. You'll always want more. And that's true. I've never met a wealthy person who didn't want more money. Hmm. At the same time, you'll never be satisfied with money. Also true. And the love of money, it says elsewhere in another proverb, Money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Again, another proverb. Those, those words, I think, were that I quoted were familiar to you. They stick with you. Why did they stick with you? Did you memorize them? I doubt it. You might have. But it's just because they, they stick. They, they are memorable. And therefore, you remember them. And they're short enough that you don't have to sit and memor memorize them at great length. As my daughter is learning memorization in her school now, and she's capable of you know, memorizing chapters and you know, pages of scripture, which is fantastic. But that's work. Well, it's not for her. It's at least not the way it would be for you, and certainly not the way it would be for me now, because it gets harder as you get older. But these things do stick. Proverbs tend to stick. Uh, because of their form. So they are, they're simple, but they're profound. On the other hand, they're specific, but also general. They're particular, but they're also universal. Illustrations are best when they're made in the form of a very concrete, recognizable situation. So you can use a, a sermon illustration, you can use 
anything you have in your hand. But it's best if what you have in your hand is something everyone else has in their hand. So this is a great sermon illustration. For You can use it for multiple reasons. Because if people have smartphones, then you can talk about something about the quality of that which will be generally applicable as well as referring to a specific object. So that would make it the subject of a good proverb. Smart, he who looks at his smartphone becomes dumb. <laughs> proverb. It's not a very good proverb, I just made it up on the spot. And it's generally true having said that and maybe memorable as such, but uh, that would be it. So it's a spe specific thing you will instantly identify it, it has general application, and I'm not sure it was profound, but there was some truth to it. So the form, the form of a proverb, it, it, it also tends to rely heavily on uh, the tropes, and if you're doing practical criticism with me, and I think I put the handout on the website as well, um, the tropes of metaphor and simile. Now tropes, and these particular tropes, metaphor and simile, are artful deviations from the ordinary or the principal signification of a word or words. Note that it's the deviation from the primary or normal signification, what they usually mean. It means something different. So an example of a, meta a metaphor is a cheerful, a cheerful heart is good medicine. It's an implicit comparison between two things of unlike nature that have something that unites them. A cheerful heart, good medicine. These are two unlike things. What do they have in common? Well, in uh, modern psychology, they talk about the importance of a, having a positive mental outlook which you can gain through a variety of ways. And it's good medicine. It's, it's, a, it's proverbial. The metaphor is in the implicit comparison of two things that are unlike. There's a metaphor, a simile. Um, all flesh is like grass. Or in Psalm 1, the wise man will be like a tree planted by rivers of waters. The like or as. In a metaphor, the comparison is implicit. In a simile, it's explicit because you're saying like or as, so you're explicitly identifying the fact that you are comparing uh, two things of unlike nature. By using the implicit comparison, interestingly, you're almost saying this is that. So a cheerful heart is good medicine. You're almost saying the one is like the other. It's a closer comparison, whereas the one is just like it. So the fact that it's implicit doesn't make it less uh, st strong. It makes it more strong, the comparison that is. So these tropes, these uh, uh, metaphors and similes are, are very strong. And I'm going to give you a, a wonderful quotation from Francis Thompson, who's an English poet. And he says this about the Bible as a, as a book of proverbs or wisdom. He says that the Bible is a treasure of gnomic wisdom, G-N-O-M-I-C, pithy short sayings. I mean its richness in utterances of which one could, as it were, chew the cud, like a cow. This, of course, has long been recognized in biblical sentences have passed on into the proverbial wisdom of our country. Yes. And the same proverbs that have passed into the English language you will find are there in other European languages or other languages where scripture has been read and has had an influence on the life of that people. So the proverbs from scripture are there in English, but they're also to be found in other European languages, and I don't know many other languages, so I'm not sure about others. 
but wherever the Bible has had an influence on the, the, the people and their character, these Proverbs are in, embedded in the language and people don't even recognize that they came from Scripture, which is it's in itself interesting. So the really pithy uh, and wise bits get passed into practical, everyday sayings that are true to life. And that says something about the nature of uh, wisdom literature as well. You don't even have to identify it as God's word for this to ring true for you. I'm not saying it's not right to see it that way, but I'm just saying these are generally true sayings that everyone will recognize. So uh, phrases like being your brother's keeper or working by the sweat of your brow or your sin will find you out, those are all embedded in the English language. And the Christian may know where they came from. The non-Christian have no idea, but would still quote them. The sweat of your brow. Am I my brother's keeper? Your sin will find you out. The sense that what you do in secret will be known in public at one point or another. And it, invariably so. <coughs> so the, so the um, literary form. Let me make a few comments on that, and we, then we will look at the uh, book of Proverbs and we'll look at Ecclesiastes in, in greater detail. Yes, sir. Professor, um, how do you spell Nomic? Francis Thompson, with oh. or without a P? Uh, without. So it's T-H-O-M-S-O-N? No, it's got a P. <laughs> it does have a P. Oh, okay. Yes, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And he's an English poet? Yes. Thank you. Wrote The Hound of Heaven. Oh, he wrote that? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which you know. Yeah. But you didn't know who wrote it. No. No, well, now you do. So the best way to get into Proverbs is to look at Proverbs. Uh, so as I say, Proverbs are brief utterances. And this is partly what makes it memorable, its brevity. But it's not just that, it's, it's not just that it's brief, it is memorable and the memorability comes from certain features. Now one of them is that it escapes ordinary terms of expression, so it's highly poetic. Like your sin will find you out. That's a, that's a proverbial saying, but sin there is being used in a personified, it's using personification, right? I mean, sin is, what is sin? I'm not quite sure. It's, it's not a person. It's not really a thing. It's not a thing in the sense of an object. It's, it's a disposition of some sort, but now it's being personified. Your sin will find you out as if it's searching, it's seeking you. Or the devil prowls about like a roaring lion. Similarly, So your sin will find you out, but so will the devil, who's like a lion, both describing something similar. The only difference is the one is a supernatural agent other than you, and the other, your sin, is your own contribution to the problem. But these are overcoming the effect of cliché. These are not clichés. All of the phrases that I just uttered, nobody would regard these as clichés because cliches are trivial statements and none of those statements was trivial. There seems to be something profound about each of them. So it's a concentrated and tightly packed form of language that not only um, uh, is it the language that is dense, it's the meaning that's dense. So it's like a diamond. It's, it's hard. You need great skill with words. You need a skill not just with words, but with syntax. The arrangement, the ordering of the words matters. It's a gift, a literary gift, to be able to write proverbs. It takes time to come up with them, even though they're brief. The aim of that is to make a 
insight or a teaching a permanent feature of the consciousness of those that hear it. You are not to forget these Proverbs. So the teaching at the beginning of Proverbs I got it there? Yes, I do. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, etc. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Well, there's the first proverb right there. There's the purpose and there's the proverb. You didn't know the words that came before it. You did know that one. Right? The for, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or knowledge. <laughs> so it keeps it as a permanent insight, so permanent that again, uh, they become passed on into the ordinary uh, wisdom, as it were, of, of people. Uh, so they take an experience, they strip it down to, its, to, its, to the studs, they take away everything that's irrelevant. They take away the local context. They take away the specific instance in which it was uttered. They take away all description. So there's no scenery. So there's no context. They reduce it and then they fix it to the most permanent thing, which is the things that never change. So Sol Solomon's wisdom is as valid now as it was when he uttered it. There has been no change. So most forms of literature uh, invite contextualization. And you'll hear people say, you know, uh, this, this pithy saying, a text without a context is a pretext for a con. You ever heard that? Have you heard it? I thought I made that up. But I'm not sure I did. Maybe I just heard it somewhere and I repeated it. A text without a context is a pretext for a con. Clever, right? It's clever, but it's not particularly wise. And in this case, it's not true either. You don't need a context for a, a wise saying. In fact, the, the context would suggest that it suits that time and place and is not perennially useful. Whereas wisdom literature never becomes invalid. It is always not only true, but more importantly, it's always practical, and that's interesting. That's particularly interesting in our age, because we're, our world is so different from the ancient world in its context. And yet the wisdom of the book of Proverbs, I think, will strike our generation as profoundly as it would any other generation, which is very interesting. And the book of James does that to some degree, as long as it's not misunderstood and read as, you know, sort of uh, imperative. So it, it, it fixes this in, in its stable aspect, having taken away, stripped away all of the context, and then so it, it sews it up for eternity. I like that phrase as well. These are moments of epiphany. These are moments, flashes of human insight as well. And uh, Solomon, the wisest character in scripture, is the one who is accredited with most of what we call wisdom literature. Who else is, I mentioned the book of James. Who's James? Yeah? Yeah, anyone think it's anyone else? That's what I've always heard. James the Just, as he was known. James, the man who lived in the same house as Jesus and didn't acknowledge that his brother was who he said he was for 30 years. He wasn't one of his disciples till after he died. Does that have anything to do with his particular wisdom? I have no idea what the answer is. I find it curious that he is writes in wisdom literature having learned probably the folly of his apprehension of Jesus for 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. Right? And then obviously 
uh, alongside many others after his brother dies and is raised and ascends has the Holy Spirit given to him and now apprehends who he is and there must have been such a like his immediate family what would it be like for them having rejected him for not one moment like the crowds do but for X number of years like what a moment for them because their human experience would be a part of their coming to faith and then you you would look back in hindsight and think about all the moments when you had the conflict and you were convinced that your brother was wrong when he he wasn't wrong <laughs> he was right and you were wrong but now it was apparent but all of the areas of life that that would apply to he would have be able to draw on those and, and hence he writes the book of James I think which is wisdom practical experience it, I, it's total speculation on my part but uh, it is interesting that it is in that form of all the of all the books in the New Testament it's the only one yes could that be why in its 108 verses it has 54 commands but why would that be all that he went through all that oh I see I never thought that through before until you just said it now and well wisdom speaks with authority right yeah yeah and of course, there are commands in Paul's and John's and uh, other epistles as well, you know, Peter's, but not quite the same. I mean, James is very much making commands, but and, but there's an incoherence to them as well. Like it doesn't have the book of James that it, it all seems to hold together, but it doesn't hold together as a form. It's It does have the proverbial quality. It's all true, but it's dense. It's like a diamond packed alongside a diamond together. You get a diamond quarry there. This is, he's so no-nonsense, you know? Oh, very much so. So people love James. He's, he is no-nonsense. It's very black and white because wis that's wisdom literature. If you think back to, again, the book of uh, the first psalm, which is also a type of wisdom psalm, it's very much. It's, you're, it's this way or that way. It's the path of wisdom or it's the path of folly. There's no, there's no gray area. It's this, that, that's it. You're on this path or you're on that path. And make it, make it clear. Now that's the voice of wisdom. In experiential terms, it doesn't always seem so black and white. And if you look at the narrative portions of scripture, it's not so black and white. But in, in wisdom literature, it is black and white. It's, it's this or that. So that it, it has a power and it's very helpful and it's very instructive because when you want, when somebody wants to say, which way am I going? It's over that way somewhere. That's now it's go there and turn left and do that. And then you give them the exact instruction. That is the way that's teaching. You don't want, well, if you start walking that way, yeah, you'll eventually find it. That's not helpful instruction. You want an exact, precise, do this and don't do that. Uh, so the best form of teaching has that character of being, quite frankly, um, sounding a little bit harsh or authoritative, overly authoritative, which doesn't sit well in our age either. Or maybe it does. Here's a, here's a good question. Why is Jordan Peterson a popular speaker in our day? How come? You must have thought about it. It's a really interesting phenomenon. What do you think? There you go. Yes. And he also says, he doesn't say, I hear what you're saying. And I could see that he said, no, it's like, <laughs> it's very authoritative. It's like this. And then he will support what he's saying as well. He's not just some clown who's shouting at people or whatever. I mean, his opponents might portray him in a certain caricature, but in general it's, and also it seems to be born of practical wisdom and experience and care for people. And it's about good living as well. So all these have the, so he appears to be a wise man. And I'm not disputing that he is, and I'm not saying 
that he isn't, I'm not saying either way, but he appears that way because of these features, which are to some degree the, the features of the Council of Wisdom. Yes? Right. And the reason why he refuses to pander is not because he doesn't recognize distress or people that are troubled by what he's saying. He is a psychologist, and I actually, so I have met him as well, and I think he genuinely does. Uh, he's not unaware of that, but he is more aware that there, there's a certain path that if you depart from this path, it ends badly for you, so I can't sugarcoat this, and I can't not tell you the truth. And that gives him an authority as well. So that, again, he appears wise. That's what it is. And, and of course, he writes the 12 rules for life. Well, whatever you make of that, again, it, it presents it in the form of, of standards, pithy, memorable ways of looking at things. You can hang your coats on these hooks. <clears throat> so these are great moments of... Uh, Epiphany, if you will, uh, but they are, that doesn't mean they're not complex. They are complex, more complex than a short saying would suggest. And sometimes it's because the, of the use of paradox. So what do I mean by paradox? By the way, these are all tropes that I've just been dealing with in my uh, practical criticism course. It's interesting that when we get to proverbs, we suddenly get to tropes and not schemes. These are figures with... Uh, uh, signif different signification of meaning. So what do I got as a paradox here? As my illustrations here, I'll look at my own illustrations. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now that's proverbial, 1 John 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now what's being said there? What's being said in that passage? No one's ever seen God. But if we love one another, he is seen. He's seen in the way they love one another. That, because that sort of love is not based on, has no other explanation. And it defies merit or reward. The person is, if we love one another, so if we love one another irrespective of the way we look, irrespective of what we're going to be able to gain from one another's affection, irrespective of background, uh, age, that will be a sort of love that you never see anywhere else and it will draw people and allow people to see God in a way. That's, I think, what's being said. So this is a paradox. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I'll give you the other illustration, which is not from scripture, but from William Temple. And I won't. The only thing of my very own which I contribute to redemption is the sin from which I need to be redeemed. I like that one. What? Short, pithy, memorable, profound. And when I say profound, it tends to have a experiential truth and a theological weight. And they tend to be also related to profound matters of human life. They're not trivial things like the smartphone dumb comment. That's not profound. It's a trivial illustration. It, there's no wisdom in it. It might be clever, it might be a play on smart, dumb, right? It might have the aspect of um, being something that we all recognize, so it's, we all have it, so it has the generality, but it, there's, it's not talking about anything profound to our lives. So it's not uh, a proverb, it's not a wise saying. So it's got serious subject matter. So he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, Double common as we saw. Uh, another paradoxical quality, they are specific and general, particularized and universal. I said that. So um, 
so here's one. It's, he actually uses this in Ecclesiastes again. Through sloth, or sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. Is this talking about somebody like me that's not good at home maintenance? It, it could. <laughs> it would apply there. But I think it's more generally applicable. If you are lazy, your life is going to collapse around you, just like your house will. That's, if you are not industrious, if you're a sluggard, as it says in Proverbs. I mean, look at the ant. Look what it does. It's busy. It keeps itself industrious. There is a consequence, and it, the consequence might not come immediately, or it might, but it will certainly come in the end. Your sin will find you out. So your laziness, your indolence, has a consequence on your entire life, and it can be quite devastating rather than an immediate one. So that, so that, that's it. So it, it, it has this concrete image with like a roof and a, and a house leaking, but really the reader immediately applies it outside that immediate context to general things. Proverbs tend to do that. So I talked about the form. Uh, they also tend to have the voice of human experience. So wisdom we associate with age in every culture to my knowledge. There's no fool worse than an old fool. Because wisdom ought to come with age, but it doesn't always. So things that are inappropriate or unfitting particularly strike us. So it, it has this, um, and I will make this comment, this one's really good, I like this, and it, it's again, this is from Reich, and this is page 316, Words of Delight, I think it's the same in all the editions, and I, I think this is a really interesting observation. In biblical cultures, there were three main classes of religious leaders, priests, prophets, and wise men. Jeremiah 18.18 18 refers to all three and ascribes a distinctive type of literature to each one. Law for the priest, word for the prophet, and counsel for the wise man. First two have the stamp of being God's direct word to people, while wisdom literature comes to us as a person's word to fellow humans. The truth that a proverb conveys is truthfulness to life and to human experience. That means they're generally applicable. So if you want to find bridges to scripture, that is for people who are not Christians to come and find access to scripture in a way that will draw them in and which they will find immediately relevant, I would say preach through proverbs. Or Ecclesiastes because the immediate relevance will be as plain to them as it is to you and with that bridge having been established they will be more open to the idea that actually if this is the Word of God and this is connect then the other parts that seem a little less obvious might nonetheless because of the counsel of Proverbs might nonetheless have truth to them that I had not immediately perceived. The other thing I found, I used to find really interesting, and I puzzled for many years, and I'm still not 100% sure on it, when we used to give out, or we, we being evangelicals, used to give out Bibles to people, it used to be Proverbs, Psalms, and the New Testament. That was it. Thought, What's with that? Like, why? Isn't that weird? I used to think it's the weirdest thing in the world. And my initial impression may not have been wrong. On the other hand, I'm starting to see there is some wisdom in it. Insofar as the wisdom literature really is accessible, it's very accessible. And, it, and, the, and the Psalms, as we said when we talked about the Psalms, 
they express the whole anatomy of the, of, of the human soul. It's all of the passions of life, all the suffering and the joy and the anger, and that's in the Psalms. So the wisdom literature, the whole of human experience there, and then you get the New Testament speaking to it. This is very interesting. I'm not sure I agree with it, but I, I see wisdom in using that um, as, as the book that's going to be the, fir the first one you would open to then is, is it Proverbs or Psalms? I can't even remember. But that's what used to be given to, uh, given out to people. So wisdom as a distinct and to some degree general form of literature and um, not to be neglected. How many have ever had a sermon series on the book of Proverbs in their church? None. One. No, I didn't. Two. The you first didn't. I heard was in Westminster. Oh, okay, fine. There. Yeah, well, I've heard it and I've had it in many of my churches, but yes. You have? Good. Okay. I think that uh, people be surprised. It crosses cultural um, boundaries as well in a multicultural city like Toronto. Who does not um, value wisdom? People still value wisdom. They don't want the religious stuff, but the wise, you know, rules for life. How about I? I'm interested in those. Well. You've heard of the 12 rules for life. Here's a lot more rules for life, right? These are, these are pithy saying, no, really. Never mind the 12 rules. You've heard it said, but I say to you, here are the 12, here are the many rules for life. You may find that they, they sit with you very profoundly. So um, let's look at the book of Proverbs itself. So I put the beginning up here. Um, in the individual Proverbs, now Proverbs as a whole book of Proverbs begins with, it's a two-part thing, or actually it's more than two, but it begins one to nine with this uh, opposition between, as I, we've already talked about, Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. But, and then from 10 onwards, it, it prevents, presents what we traditionally recognize as Proverbs. So if I put this down here, in Proverbs 10, we have these. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Not his father. That's the wrong way of reading it. Is a father not troubled by a foolish son as much as the mother? What do you think? I would have thought, yes. And I would have thought a wise son would make uh, the mother just as glad as the father. So it's not to be read as uh, anything other than uh, a parallelism. The mother and the father makes both of them. The wisdom makes both of them happy. The folly makes both of them sorrowful. Treasure gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The first proverb there was a direct antithesis. The second one deviates it from it with a not obvious parallel. These do not profit. This delivers from death. What's the relation of the first part to the second part? It's a little less clear takes it in a different direction. There's obviously an, an antithetical part of it. But uh, the book of Proverbs falls into multiple parts. So there is Proverbs 1 to 9, as I say, which is these two women. Uh, Proverbs uh, 10 and onwards uh, are these varieties of short, aphoristic, what we now call Proverbs. And then we get character descriptions. And let me, let me talk about a few of those. And these are portraits of the drunkard. So in Proverbs 20, 23, verses 29 to 35, we have the, a portrait of a type of individual, a drunkard. A uh, portrait of a lazy person, so uh, Proverbs 26, verses 13 to 17. Portrait of a, an evil society, 
Proverbs 30, verses 11 to 14. Let me put the evil society. Let's have a look at the evil society. And you may wonder why I'm putting that down. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. There are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. That's a portrait of a society. Uh, so these are portraits of types of people that very, uh, with, with great brevity described. Then there are short sketches, um, everything from the ant as a figure of industry and collaboration and social work. By the way, the Romans used to uh, talk about ants a little bit, but even more bees, bees as models of human community. They work constantly and they work collaboratively and they work for the common good. So regular in, uh, in, in Roman literature, you would get meditations on bees. And then the result of the bees' work is sweet honey. That's a, a wise illustration. Uh, and then the uh, subject of, of good farming. And then it concludes the book of Proverbs. It will describe um, the... Uh, what did we say, the, the woman, the good wife, and also the good king, right towards the end. So there are character portraits interspersed in the midst of all that. But let's look at uh, the first nine chapters. And the, they have very similar um, structures. So the unifying plot is these, this conflict between the two women. I've already talked about that. But there's a number of little skirmishes between them along the way. And they, there's a, a rather odd cast of characters. There's a father and a son, which is typical of a teacher and a pupil. But note that in the book of Proverbs, just like in Deuteronomy, fathers are assumed to be teachers of their sons. And that's because the teaching is primarily one of moral example. It's teaching in the wisdom of the Lord, but also the wisdom of the example laid out by the father. So it's not just incidental. It couldn't be replaced by someone else. Could be a mother and a son, but the mo mother can't be a role model for the son because she lacks what the son has, is maleness. Can't be the same thing. Doesn't work quite the same way. Uh, we get all sorts of, uh, uh, so treasure troves of wisdom there. And then we get lots of conflict.